Okay. We're going to try to finish up with uh, Mark tonight. Uh, the outline I'm about to go through of the book is a little bit lengthy. Uh, we did a summary of the book last week as we closed out. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of this. If you're taking notes, remember it is recorded. And uh, since it is rather lengthy outline, uh, I'm not going to, as I said, repeat these things. Um, There's always some kind of introduction to the book, and the introduction to this book covers chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. Verses 1 through 8 has the work of John the baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ. Verses 9 through 11 covers the baptism of Jesus. Verses 12 and 13 of chapter 1, the temptation of the Lord. And then we have the ministry or the work of the servant. Remember, he's presented as a servant in the book of Mark. Chapter 1, verse 14 through chapter 5, verse 43. We have in verses 14 through and 15 in chapter 1, his first preaching in the home area of the Sea of Galilee. Verses 16 through 20 is when he calls Simon, Andrew, James, and John. In verses 21 through 45, he performs uh, certain miracles. And chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, he's involved in controversy. Uh, you may remember when we had our lectureship on Christ, the controversialists, that uh, we dwelt a great deal on that. I don't know how anybody read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and not see controversy on every hand. People say, well, we should be controversial. Well, when you teach the truth, and there are those who don't believe the truth, and there are those who oppose the truth, and we're taught to defend the truth, there cannot help be but controversy. In chapter 2, 1 through 12, we have the healing um, of the paralytic Chapter 2, 13 through 17, you have Matthew, as he calls him, Matthew Levi, uh, and his banquet. You have the servant answering questions about fasting, chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. You have controversy about uh, plucking of grain and eating on the Sabbath, chapter 2, verses 23 through 27. And then we have him healing a man, uh, his withered hand, on the Sabbath, chapter 3, 1 through 6. Then the Savior is recorded choosing the 12 apostles, chapter 3, verse 7 through the first part of verse 19. Uh, he's accused of being, well, to put it nicely, insane, we might say crazy accused of being possessed of a demon in the latter part of verse 19 of chapter 3 all the way through 35 is where those things are covered. Uh, always remember this, when you can't refute a fellow's doctrine, always attack the person. That's what will happen every time. People have always done it, and they always will. That is, those that are dishonest. Then he teaches in parables, chapter 4, verses 1 through 34. Again, uh, in verses, uh, or chapter 435 through chapter 543, he works a number of miracles. Uh, he steals the storm on the sea, verses 35 through 41. He heals the gathering possessed of demons in chapter 5, 1 through 20. He cures Jairus' daughter, and the woman with an issue of blood in chapter 5, 21 through 43. Then we enter a second major part where he is uh, opposed. That covers chapter 1, verses, verse 1 through chapter 8, verse 26. He is rejected in his own hometown of Nazareth, chapter 6, 1 through 6. That's where we have the 
statement made that a prophet is not without honor save in his own country. And then the 12 are sent out to preach in chapter 6, 7 through 13. And then the death of, of John the baptizer, the forerunner of Christ, is recorded in chapter 6, 14 through 29. We have the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 6, 30 through 44. We have the record of our Lord walking on the water, chapter 6, 45 through 52. Then he's um, the record of him ministering to the sick of Gennesaret in chapter 6, 53 through 56. And then there's a controversy over ceremonial defilement and human traditions, chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. Then there's a record of four miracles that he worked in chapter 7, verse 24, through chapter 8, verse 26. They are the healing of the Syrophoenician woman's daughter in chapter 7, 24 through 30. The healing of the deaf man, chapter 7, 31 through 37. And then the record of his feeding the 4,000 in chapter 8, 1 through 21. Then he heals a blind man, chapter 8, 22 through 26. Following this, a major change in that we have a record of him instructing his own disciples in chapter 8, verse 27 through chapter 10, verse 52. And in chapter 8, 27 through 30, you have Peter's great confession. And then right after that, you have Peter being rebuked and corrected in chapter 8, 31 through chapter 9, verse 2. Then you have the uh, transfiguration of Christ in chapter 9, 2 through 13. And a record of him casting out a demon from a boy in chapter 9, 14 through 29. And we have three lessons, three lessons that he gave to his disciples in chapter 9 verses 30 through 50. He is teaching here how he must die, but that he will be resurrected from the dead, chapter 9, 30 through 32. And that the greatest servant is the one who is, uh, I might turn around the other way, the greatest disciple is the one who's the greatest servant, chapter 9, 33 through 37. And then he makes it very clear that he that is not against us is for us, chapter 9, 38 through 50. And uh, the teaching of the servant and uh, also his work as he goes up to Jerusalem, chapter 10, 1 through 52. It's in chapter 10, 1 through 12 that he teaches on divorce. I'll pause here and say this. This is where he gives the general teaching on divorce, one man for one woman until death do them part. Uh, you have to go to Matthew 19 to find where he adds the exception. And this is a good example to see how that you can't get the full story on things until you cover all of the scriptures that deal with that. So to know what Jesus taught on these things, you have to look not just to Mark 10, 1 through 12, but Matthew 5, 32, Matthew 19, uh, verse 6, verse uh, 9, um, and other places. Then he blesses the children in chapter 10, 13 through 16. And you have the record of him with the rich young ruler in chapter 10, 17 through 31. He enters into more predictions about his death and resurrection, chapter 10, 32 through 34. And he um, responds to those who are seeking greatness in the kingdom, chapter 10, verse 35 through verse 45. And then we have the record of him healing blind Bartimaeus, in chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Now, when we come to chapter 11, beginning in verse 1 all the way through chapter 12, verse 44, we have him being rejected. 
We begin, though, in chapter 11, 1 through 11, with his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And we have the record in chapter 11, 12 through 14, of his cursing the barren fig tree. Chapter 11, 15 through 19, he cleanses the temple. And then as they come back by that fig tree, they find it's withered. And he teaches lessons from that in chapter 11, 20 through 26. And then he gets into great disputation within the precincts of the temple in chapter 11, 27 through chapter 12, verse 44. And this is where he is questioned about his authority, chapter 11, 27 through 33. Uh, they ask him really a good question, though they weren't interested in the truth of it, but it really is a question all of us ought to ask, by what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? Those are good questions. I don't care if evil men ask them, they're good questions. Chapter 12, 1 through 12, you have the parable of the husbandman and the vineyard. Chapter 12, 1 through 17, uh, he is asked about paying tribute to Caesar. I always thought that to be interesting because have you ever noticed that we only get part of the answer? Uh, he gets the coin and he says, whose inscription's on it? And uh, they say Caesar. And that's when he says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God. But they never ask him what things are of God. And that's a good question. Okay, we render unto see the things of Caesar's. Well, then what is it that belongs to God? And there's a very simple answer to it. You do. Thus, all that you are and have in keeping the first and great commandments, love God with all you have and all you are. There are questions about his resurrection dealt with in chapter 12, 13 through 17. And then questions about the greatest commandment in chapter 12, 28 through 34. And um, questions about the anointed's uh, descent, chapter 12, 35 through 37. And then he warns his disciples against the scribes, chapter 12, 38 through 40. Then he uh, has lessons from the poor widow, chapter 12, 41 through 44. Then we enter another major change, and that is the destruction of Jerusalem that's predicted. Matthew 24 deals with that. But here uh, he does in verse thir chapter 13, verses 1 through 37. You have, first of all, the disciples' questions put to him, chapter 13, 1 through 4. And then that's when he warns against false signs of the end in chapter 13, 5 through 8. And they are taught then to personally, it's their own personal responsibility, to prepare for the crisis in chapter 13, 9 through 13. Uh, you think the crises we have gone through and are going through and other crises in the past, even in our lifetime, who knows what the future brings, if there is a future. But one thing about every one of those, um, each one of us individually must personally prepare to meet those. Um, how many times does he talk about be not deceived? Well, that's my responsibility not to believe a lie. And I have to prepare myself for that. Then he says they must flee the city when the Romans come, chapter 13, verses 14 through 23. And Judaism's government's going to be overthrown, chapter 13, 24 through 27. And thus judgment through Rome, as it was through Babylon and Israel of old, will be exercised on their generation, chapter 13, 28 through 37. Now, I think it's good to remind ourselves, having gone through this material and chapter 13, 1 through 37, on the destruction of Jerusalem, is that these people couldn't conceive of such a thing as that. They just could not. Let me ask you this. 
Can you conceive this time last year or even back in November about what we've been going through, or maybe even January of this year, what we've been going through since February, especially March? No. But if you're living every day seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, studying the Bible, instant in prayer, doing what the Bible says you ought to do, then whatever pops up tomorrow, then you're ready to face it. Then there's pictured in chapter 14, 1, through chapter 15, verse 47, the suffering and death of the Christ, the servant of the Lord. You have the record in chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, of the Jewish leaders plotting his death. Then you have Mary anointing Jesus in chapter 14, 3 through 9. The record of Judas Iscariot's bargain to betray the Lord is found in chapter 14, verses 10 through 11. And the Last Supper is recorded, that is, the Last Supper with Christ and his disciples, is found in chapter 14, 12 through 31. Following those things, they remove themselves outside the city over to the Garden of Gethsemane, chapter 14, 32 through 42. We have the record of the soldiers coming and arresting Jesus, chapter 14, 43 through 52. We have the trials of the Lord in chapter 14, 53 through chapter 15, verse 20. And that breaks down into Jesus being before the Jewish court, chapter 14, 53 through 72. Then he's before Pilate, the Roman governor, chapter 15, 1 through 20. And of course, none of these um, situations, even when he went before Herod, though it's not recorded here, did he receive any fair hearing and there was no justice given to him. In chapter 15, 21 through 47, we have the record of the crucifixion and burial of Christ. Specifically, the record of the crucifixion is chapter 15, verses 21 through 32. We have a description of his agony and his death in chapter 15, 33 through 41. There's the record of his burial in chapter 15, verses 42 through 47. Then the last major point, which I think is point six, uh, is the resurrection and the commission. We would call it the great commission of the servant. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 20. In verses 1 through 8, the first witnesses to the resurrection. Verses 9 through 12, the disciples doubted the witness. Then we have... Uh, Verses 14 through 18, the Great Commission itself. And then verses 19 through 20, the commission carried out, we might say executed. And that's a good way to outline the book. You might find yourself reading your Bible regularly and you're familiar with these things, that when you go through and list an outline like this, how much comes to mind and systematically how it helps you remember what went on in the book. Uh, you, you're not going to remember all these things, but it does help you get the main points settled in your mind. Now I would like to look at some lessons that we can draw from the book of Mark, and then we'll be through with the book of Mark. In chapter 1045, we learned that Jesus came to minister to all humanity. Thus, we the redeemed, the saints, the citizens of the kingdom of heaven, Christians, members of the body of Christ, children of God, are to do the same. Chapter 10, verse 45, I say again. Um, it's always been an amazing thing to me that while God wants every individual who's accountable to him to be saved, and they can only be saved through the gospel where he's located his power to save from sin, Yet he can't do any of that except that the church fulfilled its responsibility 
in preaching the gospel. So the spiritual body of Christ is linked with its Savior and the head of the church. And thus, off and on in sermons over the years, we pointed out to people that we Christians, members of the body of Christ, are his mouth and we are his hands. We get done what the head authorizes us to do. Frankly, his work on earth does not get done if his church, his spiritual body, doesn't carry out the will of the head. You can see, too, when you look at Mark, and we talked about this last week, how that children who are raised in a godly home get the benefits of a godly home. I think we know enough about Mark to see that he had that kind of home. And because he had that kind of home, look at the people to whom he was exposed. And that's an amazing thing. Another is that all of us need somebody like Barnabas to give us another chance when we fail. The people who fail and don't try again, in other words, you get knocked down, you don't ever try to get up, then I don't care how many Barnabases are around, they're not going to help you. So this tells me that Mark had to be willing to get up and go. He had to leave with Barnabas. He had to go with him on another trip. He had to master what he'd failed on in the first trip. Then too, like the Lord, this ties into the first one, when I'm ministering to humanity, we need to be busy about our Father's business. Sometimes people say, why don't you tend to your own business? Well, think about what the business of the spiritual body of Christ is, and that means the members in particular. So we need to be able to say to each other and to everybody else, no, you're not, but I must be about my Father's business. That's why the emphasis is placed so much by Jesus on the truth of Matthew 6, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things should be added unto you. Remember, we're just pilgrims passing through, and we don't know when things are going to end. In verse uh, 17 of chapter 1, Jesus called those people to be fishers of men, and we are to do our best, according to our several abilities, opportunities, to also fish for men looking for every opportunity, even making opportunities to be able to teach others. Then we must reflect the same compassion that our Lord had for those who are suffering, suffering humanity. What a pattern to follow when you look to Jesus in anything, but especially his compassion on those who suffer. Chapter 1, verse 41. We're not, and he taught this, just to help those who are nice to us, but we're to help those who aren't nice to us. And again, the parable of the Good Samaritan is a great lesson on that. Then we must learn, as is taught in chapter 2 and verse 10, that Jesus, and only Jesus, has the power or authority to forgive sins. And because of that, we should look to him for his terms of salvation, terms of pardon, and how to be faithful, and only to him. We should compare and contrast everything that's held out to us as the way we ought to do this, that, or the other, ought not to, to see if that is approved by the last will and testament of Jesus. Then we need to be grateful that Christ came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Chapter 2, verse 17. Jesus is the great physician. He makes the point to say, you know, the whole need not a physician. It's those that are sick that need a physician. Well, we were sick and found uh, Christ, and we should be grateful in finding Christ through his gospel message that we did and that we ought to hold out that same gospel message without addition 
contraction or alteration to not be tampered with. And then a big one that we all have to work on, but it's so very important, especially in these times, we can't let the cares of this present world or the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things choke the word of God out of our lives. We've got to be doing all we can to give proper attention to God's truth and our application of it to our lives, as well as showing other people the importance of doing the same thing. We need to do like the man that set out in chapter 5, verse 19. Once we have found the Lord, we need to tell them the great things the Lord has done for us. Now, I'm not trying to say be like the dominational people and give up and get up before a crowd and let me tell you what Jesus has done for me but we should be able to show through the teaching of the truth that we have believed and that we've obeyed and that we continue to live by as to what has changed our lives or converted us. Then we must, chapter 6 and verse 3, not be offended in the Lord or by his doctrine. If we are rebuked by the Lord, that is the truth exposes our sins and we see it, we shouldn't be upset and trying to cover it up and hide it. We should just simply take our medicine, acknowledge the same, do what's necessary to make sure God knows that we repented of those things. And there's an interesting thing here too, and especially important in this hustling, bustling age in which we've all and brought up in and lived in a long time. There are times when we need to go apart into a desert place and rest a while. Chapter 6, verse 31. I don't think people nowadays understand the importance of that, that we need to get away from all the hubbub and let the rat race go, run by us and just go somewhere and meditate. Or as the Old Testament writer said, be still and know that I am God. It refreshes and it strengthens and helps us to rise back up to face whatever it is the devil throws at us. And then we need to remember that whatever we're called upon to do, as the song says, even though it be a cross to bear, that God does all things well. Chapter seven and verse 37, the Lord does all things well. Our problem is that we, he want, we want him to do things well with us in the easiest possible way. Well, sometimes that just can't help him. I've always, as many of you know by now, like medicine. And I watch these medical shows sometimes in the emergency rooms, and you can see some of the awfulest things in the world as far as compound fractures and them straightening everything out. You know, in order to help those people, many times they have to hurt them. Isn't that amazing? We've never learned that but yet they do in order to help them, to make them well, to get them back in good health, they have to hurt them. Now they don't want to hurt them. And most good doctors and nurses don't try to hurt you, but it's just the nature of the case. If they're going to set a bone or if they're going to do this, that, or the other, it's in the nature of the case that to do what's good for you causes pain. But in the case of our Lord, who chastens us at times because he loves us, then he doeth all things well. We need to have the spirit of acquiescing to his, to his will on the matter. Then when we mind the things of men, there's plenty of people to do that, rather than the things of God, what we're taught in chapter 8, verse 33 is that we actually become the adversary of the Lord. You'll remember when the Lord began to tell the disciples he must go up to Jerusalem and be put to death. And Peter said, no, 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 
not so, Lord. Then he told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. But thou savorest not the things be of God, but the things of men. Many times, times the things that be of God put us through painful situations. And yet no one went through more shame and agony than did our Lord, and it's all for our sake. So as a member of his spiritual body and doing his will, then we should mind the things of God rather than the things of men, lest we become our Lord's adversary. I mean, by the attitude we have now and the words you're saying and our planning and purposing and our action, is the Lord saying in heaven, get thee behind me, Satan? Well, I hope not. He's not going to speak audibly, but his words here to let us know when we have those kind of thoughts, engage in those actions, or we omit from our lives those things we ought to do. Chapter 8, verse 38, it's very clear that Christ is going to be ashamed of those who in this life are ashamed of him. There's a lot of folks that don't want to speak up for the Lord are solely those things that need to be done for fear of losing friends, the fear of their jobs, for fear of all sorts of things. But John said that perfect love casteth out fear. How does it do that? You love me, keep my commandments. Well, if you have perfect love, complete love, you'll be doing God's will. And that will cast out fear. The apostles lived to see the Lord's kingdom established on earth, chapter 9, verse 1. We need to emphasize the many people who think they're saved, yet they look toward a kingdom in our future. Oh, the kingdom's been here almost 2,000 years. And thus, there are people that are in it, and they've enjoyed the benefits and privileges of being citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And we need to teach them that's available for all those to be a Christian is to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Interesting statement by our Lord in chapter nine in verse 23, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now, if you don't watch out, you'll take that out of its literary environment or its setting. And you'll say, well, that means then I can believe strongly enough in my mind that somebody's dying of cancer and that person will be healed. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Because after all, it is appointed unto men once to die after that judgment. Our eternal reward is not in this life, not in this fleshly body. Our eternal reward it's after this life's over with, this whole material universe is gone. And there's a new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So it's obvious that all things are possible to him that believeth. Well, they're all things regulated by the will of heaven. What it's talking about, since faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, what we need is to trust in God, to believe in God, to have faith in God solely and only on the basis of what the Word teaches. So a whole host of folks will talk about, well, I believe God can do this and so. Well, does he say he will in the Bible? Well, no, but I think he can. Well, you were right the last time when you said you think he can, but what you think he can do and what he will do and how he will do it and when he'll do it, the reason he does it, is only found in the teaching of the Bible. So a lot of folks today use believe in the modern usage of it by meaning that's what I think. We've got to be careful as we say, well, I, I believe God can do this and so. I don't believe he'll do this and so except that he said so. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Chapter 10, 24, he talks about uh, it's easier for a camel to go through die of an eagle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that this is a needle like a sewing needle. It's interesting when you read Luke's account, he being a physician, he actually uses the Greek word 
uh, for a needle that a doctor would use, we would say, they'd sew somebody up. Job's witnesses think that he's talking about going through a gate that was called the eye of the needle, where a camel had to get down on its knees to be able to go through it. But that's not at all what it says. Well, why is it easier for a camel to go through the eye, we'll say a sewing needle, than it is for a rich man to go to heaven? Because it doesn't say that he can't go to heaven, does it? In fact, if you read the rest of it, he'll say all things are possible to God. Well, there are very few people who have the great wealth of this present world that get interested in anything but getting that wealth, having that wealth, and keeping that wealth. And all you have to do is read Ecclesiastes, written from the point of view of a person who trusted solely in the affairs of this life. And over and over again, he'll say of the person who thinks that way, vanity of vanity. Vanity is pointlessness, emptiness. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Well, without God, it is. Without God, what is the worth of anything in this life? So, yes, a rich man can be saved, but most won't because they love this present world. They love the things they possess, and they don't want to give it up. That's the reason the rich young ruler was told, go and sell all you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And he went away sorrowful, for he was very rich. He loved his riches. Well, you don't have, and you have to ask the question, what's a rich man? Well, that's kind of a up to each person subjective view of who's rich. So in America, I think we all have to think about that. The poorest one of us richer than a lot of folks in the world. So really it's talking about this. If the affairs of this present world and the materials of this present world mean more to you than learning God's will and doing it, living your life in harmony with it, then this world, whether you have millions of dollars, billions of dollars, hundreds of dollars, or thousands of dollars, or not even a hundred dollars, then that's going to keep you out of heaven because you cannot do the will of God and care for this world. In chapter 11, verse 24, all things whatsoever ye pray and ask for, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Well, again, dealing with the apostles and their work on earth as the ambassadors of the court of heaven, then Christ was revealing to them those things they were to bind on earth. But for us who are not apostles, then we believe, and this echoes back to what I said a moment ago, all things are possible in that believeth. We believe on the basis of what the Bible tells us. How do I, how is it that I can believe I've, um, worshiped properly on the first day of the week when I don't partake of the Lord's Supper in the way the Bible teaches. Well, I have no right to believe that that's acceptable worship, but I won't do one of the acts of worship. So it's a matter of what the Bible teaches. I've said this many times, you've heard me say it, that if I say I believe, meaning not I think it's so, but I believe in the sense of I have faith in God that it's so, I better be able to find a direct statement. I better be able to find an example, or I better be able to find it implied in the words of the New Testament. And if you can't find it there, then you don't have any authority from Christ to say, well, I believe it. We only believe what's taught in the Bible. Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We mentioned we... Um, must render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God, chapter 12, verse 17. This would go a long way toward settling a lot of problems going on right now in America. If people understood the relation of a relationship of Christians, particularly to the civil government. I don't know why we can't realize that Romans chapter 13 was written under the harsh rule of the Roman Caesars, people like Herod, the Herods, and others. And yet, we're taught plainly to obey the laws of the land. 
And the only time we have a authority from God to disobey the laws of the land is when the laws of the land, by keeping them, make us violate the laws of heaven. A lot of times we think, well, I just don't like the way that's done, so I'm going to go it my way. Well, that doesn't touch top, side, bottom, or edge of what Paul taught in Romans 13. Paul even said that if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. So we need to understand that God holds us accountable for not obeying the laws of the land, and we sin when we violate it. It doesn't mean just we keep those we like. And like Mary of Bethany, recorded in chapter 14, 3 through 9, we're to give the very best we have to the Lord. He doesn't accept second best. We give the very best. And then when we, each time that we observe the Lord's Supper, we need to know that Jesus communes with us, chapter 14, 22 through 25. Why it's also called a communion. And when we're taking of the bread, our mind ought to be on the body of Christ, the sinless body of Christ, that he willingly offered as sacrifice for our sins. The Lord tells us, I'm right there with you. Same thing through the fruit of the vine, representing his blood. That's the reason we need to meditate, and there needs to be an atmosphere created by those making up the auditorium or assembled in the auditorium, wherever the assembly may be, each Christian partaking of it ought to have their mind on those emblems. They are emblematic, the bread of the body of Christ, and the fruit of the vine of the blood of Christ, and the soberness that ought to be in our minds relative to the fact we're thinking about what was done on our behalf when we didn't deserve it, the sinless dying for the sinful. Then every first day of the week, we have the opportunity to assemble, engage in every act of worship God expects to be done by every Christian in the sacred assembly. And yes, I call it sacred assembly because we come together for one reason, and that is to worship God on the first day of the week. No other reason. We have Bible classes at times because we're coming together anyway so we can meet earlier and study the Bible together. But there's one assembly that God obligates every Christian to be in, and that's the assembly of worship on the first day of every week. Others are important. The elders call the church together for Bible study, for gospel meetings, for lectureships, other things that we might do. But there is that one assembly where Christians will assemble out of obligation to God to worship him according to his will on the first day of every week. And then the last thing we'll notice is one we know the most. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Chapter 16, verse 16. Sometimes we get so involved with denominational theologians and debaters who try to come at that every way under the sun to show it doesn't mean what it says. That many times what we just need to do is keep telling people, he that believeth in his eyes shall be saved. Yeah, but, but, but. Okay, we've heard all your buts. Let's see. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So a lot of times just emphasizing the truth, just repeating it, breaks through a lot of man-made doctrine like fire breaks through ice. So that's where we are, and we finished Mark. We'll start out in the same approach to Luke in our time together, the Lord willing, next week. And I hope as you're studying each one of these verses on your own as you read, that some of these things will come back to you and that they will be even more sharpened in your mind by these brief studies.